Well, good evening, good evening, and welcome to this service of evening prayer. My name is Reverend David, and I'm one of the curates at St. Matthew's and St. Luke's in Darlington, and St. Michael's in Huntington, and St. Andrew's in Bolum. And a very warm welcome if you're joining us for the first time today. What we're going to be doing is a service of evening prayer based on the Book of Common Prayer. I'm going to minimize myself in a moment, and behind me will be all the liturgies, so everything you need should be on the screen before you. Uh, but before we begin, let me just wish you a Happy New Year. And today, a happy official end to the Christmas season, as today is the beginning of the season of Epiphany, the season when we celebrate the appearance and manifestation of Jesus Christ, the King of the universe to the world. So my friends, could I invite you to a posture of prayer, I invite you to perhaps close your eyes, fold your hands, plant your feet, whatever it may be, uh, as you, we bow our heads before Almighty God. Beloved, we are come together in the presence of Almighty God and of the whole company of heaven to offer unto him through our Lord Jesus Christ our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to make confession of our sins, to pray as well for others as for ourselves, that we may know more truly the greatness of God's love and show forth in our lives the fruits of his grace, and to ask on behalf of all men such things as their well-being doth require. Wherefore, let us sit or kneel in silence and remember God's presence with us now. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Savior Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us therefore confess our sins, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Grant, we beseech thee, merciful Lord, to thy faithful people pardon and peace, that they may be cleansed from all their sins and serve thee with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now let us pray as our Saviour has taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, open thou our lips, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. So I invite you to say the Magnificat with me responsorially, joining me on the even verses. This is the wonderful song of Mary at the Annunciation. My soul doth magnify the Lord. And my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering his mercy, hath helped his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Now for our first reading, which is taken from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 60, beginning at the first verse. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples, but the Lord rises upon you, 
and his glory appears over you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. All assemble and come to you. Your sons come from afar, and your daughters are carried on the arm. Then you will look and be radiant. Your heart will throb and swell with joy. The wealth on the seas will be brought to you. To you the riches of the nations will come. Herds of camels will cover your land, young camels of Midian and Ephah, and all from Sheba will come, bearing gold and incense and proclaiming the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, chapter 2, beginning at the first verse. Glory to you, O Lord. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests, the teachers of the law, and asked them where the Christ was to be born, In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. Amen. May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A king is born, but a king is already there, and there isn't room for more than one king. What I want to do today is talk to you about faith. Faith is a sort of mirror that is held up to us and to the world to reveal to us where our true priorities may be, where our loyalties are. And I want to do this by first talking about someone named Anne Martha. Now, Anne Martha is a wonderful person my wife met on a recent trip to Egypt. Anne Martha and Hannah became fast friends. Anne Martha is a Christian. She is a priest. She's from the Diocese of the Arctic. And she is Indigenous First Nations Inuit. Now, if you know anything about the relationship between the government of Canada and the First Nations, you would know that Canada has been horrific horrific to the First Nations peoples. Hundreds of years ago, the government had an indigenous problem. So for hundreds of years, the government stole or kidnapped children and raised them, and I use that term loosely, in what were known as residential schools. The aim was to eradicate the local cultures and assimilate them into Canadian society. And this is the face of the worst of Canadian colonialism. And I have to say the churches were complicit in this. It was thought that to be a good Canadian was to be a good Christian, and what resulted was hundreds of years of abuse, neglect, and horrors, whose ramifications are still being borne out today. A tragedy and another stain upon the Church. Another reason why I personally am so suspicious of any direction the ch Church ends up taking from the culture around us. It never, ever, ever has gone well. But Anne Martha, as an Inuit, as a Christian priest, uh, this seems unlikely. Why are you a Christian? My wife asked her. How could it be? And Anne Martha, she said something wonderful. She said, well, it wasn't just her. It was her entire community, that they all were Christian. Because it is really true. The things from their own culture, the things that they already had, that were already present, the belief in a creator God, the goodness of the world, these anticipated the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel affirmed all of these things, that in Jesus these things were fulfilled. Wonderful answer. And she went further to say that 
What the government and the churches had meant for evil, God had meant for good. That God brought salvation to the people, even through the bad. And praise be to God for that. Well, we see something similar in our story of the Magi today. The good and the bad. We see the Magi and coming to the religious leaders of the day. Religious leaders and the, and the political powers uh, in cohort, in, in concert. So what do we read? We read, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem, in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now in our readings, we've already seen the angels appear to the shepherds in night by night and the shepherds going and paying him homage. Well, we don't get angels in our story today, but we get a star. We get a star and this is what leads the Magi to go and leave their homes. There's been a lot of speculation about the star. Some say it was a supernova, others say a comet, others the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn, each of which had happened during that time. But whatever it was, the astronomers, they recognized the moment for what it was. It was a sign of great things. You see, these were known as members of the Persian priestly caste, uh, folks who would advise the king and interpret dreams. Uh, they were astrologers, scientists, soothsayers, sages, practitioners in mystical knowledge of some sort or another. But they were Gentiles, custodians of a religious and philosophical system that developed outside of the land of Israel. You see, they don't have the special revelation of scriptures. They didn't come to Jerusalem following a prophecy, as it were, but following the light that they have seen. Yes, speculation was rife at the time that a ruler of the world would emerge from Judah. The Magi looked to the heavens and recognized the moment for what it was. And we have to give them credit because they didn't just note it and stay put. But they saw the sign and they got up and they did something about it. They left the comfort of their own homes. They went on a journey. They went to worship him. Incredible. Incredible. This, you can see, that religion... Even this pagan one can become the path to true knowledge, the path to Jesus Christ. But perhaps when religion fails to open up to Jesus in his presence, it actually opposes the true God and his Savior. It becomes demonic and destructive. The Magi, they represent religion at its best, moving, moving towards Jesus Christ. Well, you see, the religious leaders and King Herod, well, they represent religion at its worst. We read, The Magi came to Jerusalem and asked King Herod, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. And they replied, In Bethlehem, in Judea. And what we see here is the beginnings of a great juxtaposition between perhaps good religion moving towards Christ and bad religion which we saw with the Canadian government and the churches of the time and the Inuit First Nations peoples. King Herod, otherwise known as Herod the Great, was anything but great. Not to be confused with his son, who was also named Herod, who ended up uh, beheading John the Baptist. This King Herod was a scary dude. Backed by the power of Rome, he came and established himself as the king of Israel by military conquest of his own people. Of his own people. He was ruthless. As the historian Josephus records, quote, So that there would be widespread mourning at the time of his own death, Mad Herod ordered that a member of every family was to be killed when he died. And thankfully, that was never fulfilled. But these are the folks that the Magi, this is the guy the Magi comes to meet. The new king has been born to the Jews. They go to the capital to seek him out. And it makes sense that a king would be born in a palace, but he wasn't there. And King Herod is understandably disturbed by this surprise visit and all Jerusalem with him. There isn't room for two kings. And recognize this. This is the epitome or a picture of the wider conflict between the world and what Christ is trying to bring for the world. Herod represents the resistance of this world to God's divine kingship represented in Jesus. He wants to snuff out his rival. And Herod, he asks the Magi the question, when? He wants to go and worship the new king, so it seems. 
but he acts hypocritically. What he really has is murder in his heart. He wants to snuff out this little king, newborn king. Well, the Magi, they leave. Well, what happens first, actually? The teachers of the law, the chief priests, the scribes, they appear for the first time in Matthew's story. Again, reflecting in advance the religious system of the time. They know what the scriptures say. They give an answer to where he can be found, sending him off to Bethlehem. But they don't get up and do anything about it. It's the foreigners, these others, who go and, and give homage. For whatever reason, the religious leaders at the time are probably fearful probably capitulating to the culture and to the system of the day, the rule of the world. I want to note this just before we move on. The natural world, the star and the interpretation of its meaning can only get the Magi so far. It gets them to Jerusalem, wonderful, most of the way. But it's the revelation of the scriptures that sets them off on the last leg of their journey. It's the word of God as given to his people that is necessary to bring these Magi to their final goal. From this revelation, they go out and are overjoyed, and we read, overjoyed that the star now leads them on, now not just to Bethlehem, but to the very site where the Christ child and his mother were staying. And thus, here at the very beginning of Jesus' life, this great juxtaposition happens. The Gentiles, the Magi, they welcome Israel's Messiah, while Christ's own people, the Jewish people, play the role to the plot against him. This ironic pattern is repeated again and again through Jesus' public ministry, and I guess we should say, even today. So they went on their way. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. They opened their treasures and presented the Lord with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. I think we need to marvel at the faith of the Magi who through human eyes see only an ordinary child in Bethlehem, but by faith see so much more. They fall down and worship him in human flesh and offer him gifts of gold for his kingship, frankincense for his divinity, and myrrh for his humanity as a foreshadowing of his death and his burial. And if I can just say, if only we could have such a faith, if only the world can recognize that the true fulfillment of all of our desires, of all of our systems, of all of our beliefs actually find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ himself. May we have eyes that see, ears that hear, eyes of faith. And may we recognize that when we pray, it's not just to an empty abyss that we speak to, but to the God who is alive and hears our prayer. That when we worship, it's not just to nothingness, but we worship him. Him who is the foundation of the world and saved us all. That we, when we come to the Eucharist, that we meet him, not just, don't, don't, we meet just not, not just bread and wine, but the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that he is with us every step of our journey through this life. That he is guiding us, moving us, prompting us, and bringing us back to him and his love again and again and again. So I invite you, my friends, to hold up that mirror, that mirror of faith to your own lives. Where are your priorities? Where are your loyalties? In what direction are you being led at this time? And in what way is this being fulfilled in Christ, or is this being fulfilled in something evil? Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So I invite you to say with me the Nunc Dimittis, the Song of Simeon. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen this salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and to be the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. So we say now the faith of our baptism. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, 
and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you, and with thy spirit. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us, and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save the King, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness, and make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. O God, make clean our hearts within us, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. And a special prayer set for today, this first Sunday of Epiphany. O God, who by the leading of a star manifested your only Son to the peoples of the earth, mercifully grant that we, who know you now by faith, may at last behold your glory face to face, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. At the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, could I invite you to please respond, hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for the gift of the world. Thank you for the peoples of the world. And we thank you, Lord God, that you call all of us to come and to know you, to be in relationship with you and receive your salvation, which you have won for us. We thank you for the wise men, that they were bold enough to leave their homes, to follow the star and to enter into a foreign territory, that they were able to meet you and fall down at your feet, at the, on, on their knees, on their faces, uh, before your feet and worship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the world at this time. We pray that you would reveal yourself to the world in word and deed, that your ambassadors would go out and recognize the good things that are happening and baptize them, to bless them, to be ambassadors of your love, your mercy, your goodness, wherever it is needed. Pray especially for those places in the world where there is so much suffering at this time. Praying especially for the people of Gaza, people of Israel, people in Ukraine, the people of Russia, and all those other many places where there is conflict at this time. Grant us, Lord, a sense of your mercy and your love, a sense of your presence in the midst of our struggles, that we would be able to rejoice with the wise men, rejoice with the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for this country and its needs. We pray that we would not be an obstacle to you, that we would not capitulate to the culture, but Lord God, that we would capitulate to you and your image, that we would become the people that we have always been meant to be, creatures made in the image of Christ. Pray, Lord God, for those who find it so difficult at this time to heat their homes or put food on their tables or both, Lord Jesus, for those who are seeking employment. I pray for those who are asking for help. And I pray for those who need help but are too afraid to ask. I pray that the world and the people around them have eyes to see and ears to hear their role in providing that assistance, to providing that care and that love. That, Lord Jesus, your face would be seen amidst the goodness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for all of those who are diseased at the moment, all those who are sick, those who are weak, those who are dying, 
anyone who perhaps is uh, participating, participating, any of those who have anything to do at this time with the NHS, whether as patient or staff, Lord Jesus, that you would work in and through them. Pray especially for our sister Libby at this time, as she recovers in Bishop Auckland, or that you would heal her body and bring her back. And my friends, if there's anyone in specifically specific that you would like to pray for at this time, I invite you to do so. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for those who mourn. Trusting in the good news of Christmas, of Epiphany, of Easter, knowing the good things that you have won for us, all benefits of your passion. The Lord Jesus, we would dwell in this world as people of hope. Renew the hope you have won for us in our own hearts. Grant us your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to meet us in our grief. I want to pray for those who grieve at this time, especially for the Richardson family, following the loss of Peter. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for your church. Pray for all the many ways in which we have messed things up and continue to do so. I pray that you continue to unite us, that we wouldn't be divided, that we would be faithful in you, that, Lord God, we wouldn't go after the spirit of the age, whatever it may be at this current time, but remain steadfast and be led closer and closer to you, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Light in our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now as we come to the end of our service, I invite you to please say together the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you this Epiphany season. May you know his love. May you know his joy. May you know who you are in him. God bless you. Amen.